very much and uh, um, thank you in particular for the opportunity to speak here. I, I really would have loved to join Dubai. I was a bit uh, skeptical in the very beginning and as it in the end turned out, um, just my entire family um, um, yeah, got sick the last two weeks, so COVID infection. We are all well, but I couldn't, there was even formally no possibility for me in the end now to to fly. Anyhow, this seems to work out well, and I'm looking forward now um, to uh, connect with you via this presentation. Um, so I, I gave it the title, The Computer as an Experimental Metaphysician, and you, you will also see during the talk how that connects uh, in a certain way to um, what we mentioned in the introduction, um, the building of trustworthy AI systems. And um, I hope I can clarify these aspects. So in my talk, I have um, different parts. First, I will uh, very briefly talk a bit about metaphysics and ex experimental sciences uh, and um, pay some time of how scientists seek to build knowledge, uh, in particular by using direct observation and measurement of concrete physical objects and phenomena in the real world. And very often, or typically, experiments are intended then to confirm or refute a particular hypothesis or theory by experimentation, by observation of the outcome of the experiments. Metaphysics, I want to spend a bit more time on as a branch of philosophy. Uh, you, many in the room, probably are way more familiar with um, uh, metaphysics than, than I myself. Uh, it studies first principles. Um, we have examples like abstract concepts such as existence, knowledge, time, space, notion of God. Um, and I want to um, dive a bit more deeply here into the topic with um, reference to an article by Timothy Williams, a uh, short article for British Acad uh, Academy. And um, I, I will read here a few um, text passages from this um, article uh, on metaphysics. So uh, here we have, uh, today the word metaphysics is used more widely for the branch of philosophy that studies in a very general way what there is and how it is. There's a deeper problem about how metaphysics relates to physics and the rest of natural science, apart from the ori origins of the words. For doesn't natural science find out what there is in the world and how it is structured? And if so, what room is left for metaphysics? Natural scientists and metaphysicians may seem to be asking the same questions. The difference is that the natural scientists base their answers on observation, experiment, measurement, and calculation. We talked about it before. While the metaphysicians base theirs on armchair reflection. So is metaphysics just lazy physics, long past its cell by date? Without, and later, of course, he defends metaphysics in the, in the short article and many um, papers. Um, um, he's himself a metaphysician, of course. Uh, later in the article, we find an, an, an text, a text passage that says, without understanding the metaphysics of numbers, as an example, we cannot properly understand the role of mathematics in science and so on. But here, why, why did I bring up that text passage? Uh, first of all, to make this distinction between um, natural sciences, experimentation, and metaphysicians, and in particular, with reference to this part here of the text, the difference is that natural scientists base their answers on observation, experiment, measurement, and calculation, while the metaphysicians base theirs on armchair reflection. And in this talk, actually, I will come back to that. And um, um, well, I will kind of challenge this position. I think that metaphysics can move in direction of an experimental science. I mean, we have it in the title. And um, therefore, I just want to highlight that part here and um, uh, tell you that we will get back in the end of the talk to this, to this part. Um, but, but first, I want to actually give you two different directions of motivations uh, from my own research, from my own positions that are relevant here. And the first is um, my point or the, the, the way I see artificial intelligence, and in particular, the relation between artificial intelligence and racial argumentations. So we s s slightly switch the context for a moment now. So for me, um, AI is more than weak AI. And first of all, we need to 
probably talk briefly about what the difference here is between weak AI and strong AI. So weak AI is about solving particular problems, chess playing, um, face recognition, and so on. But strong AI, that is the dream of the old fathers of the, the field of AI, is, is more than that. It's, it's everything that humans can do and, and possibly going beyond human intelligence, human capabilities. I mean, we are here at a conference on transhumanity and um, uh, I guess many of you are familiar, therefore, with the, with the distinction here as well. Uh, but my position here in particular is that strong AI capabilities require at least um, the following different capabilities, so the, the, the following aspects. Um, so first of all, simple problem solving. I see that in the sense of weak AI, chess playing, um, 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 I, I don't know, many of the systems we build today that solve particular pr problems in a particular domain. Um, but then there's also the more challenging aspect of exploring and acting in unknown territory. Was it a bit more challenging because you typically don't have data about this unknown territory where you can train uh, machine learning models, for instance, with. Um, and uh, it also includes robotics and so on. So think about the Mars rover, for example. But then, and that I think is very often forgotten in the current talk about AI, there are, there are further capabilities that are highly relevant. For instance, abstract and rational reasoning. So the exploration of new theories in mathematics, of new theories in metaphysics, and so on. So um, this, this capability of abstract from the physical world and build theory, theories about it, and then make these theories the subject of study. Um, it's... Uh, on the fourth level, self-reflection. So the, the capabilities of humans, for instance, to detect their own mistakes uh, or to, to detect uh, misconceptions in the theories we build and so on. So questioning the results of one's own thinking, for instance, based on experimentation. We mentioned it before. And on the fifth level, then social interaction. So we as humans are very well able to adjust our personal goals and values that drive us, also drive us in the layers three and four eventually, um, with those goals of a community to achieve, for instance, a greater good. And at the moment, we focus in AI very much on machine learning. And in my opinion, machine learning is addressing levels one and two only. And I don't see much of uh, capabilities right now covered by this technology, AI technology, in direction of uh, three, four, and five here. And what we need in order to achieve that is um, technology in direction of hybrid AI. I'm, I'm pretty convinced about that. So what we have, that is um, my, my personal conviction at the moment, is that um, we have visions of weak and unreflected AI. And we should ask the question whether today, today's AI systems actually do know what they are doing. I would say no. Uh, do we know what, what we are doing when we increasingly let such systems decide on critical issues? And is the unpredictability and the lack of normative orientation for characteristic of our future AI systems? So th this is actually why I like this analogy to this movie here by... Uh, the movie with James Dean, the original title, Rebel Without a Cause, so much. So the German title is Denn Sie wissen nicht, was Sie tun. And the movie, many of you know it probably, is about a young generation, teenagers that have, so to say, lost their normative orientation or their normative compass. And the question is, is what we are at the moment building exactly in, in the area of AI, such a generation of AI systems that are actually lacking central aspects, central capabilities in terms of ethics, norms, and um, legal uh, constraints, obeying legal constraints in the, in the real world and so on. And I think to go in that direction, also the level of explicit representations and rational argumentation about ethics, norms, and laws is, is important. And also the aspect of being capable of doing thought experiments at, an, at the level of uh, normative thinking. And, and actually, you, you find these layered ideas uh, that there's more than just an, an intuitive, fast decision-making level in uh, human cognition, also debated in, in the literature, in, uh, for instance, um, uh, philosophy, uh, um, psychology. 
Um, so here you uh, you are all aware, I guess, of the, the bestseller book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, but also in, in the, 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 the famous article, and there's way more in the literature, by Jonathan Hyde, The Emotional Dog and Its Rational Tale and so on, where you find this distinction uh, between two layers described, an intuitive, fast decision-making layer in humans, and then an, a, a slower, but rational decision control and justification layer that is capable of, in, an, in a certain way, of reflecting on the first layer. And I see here a clear analogy to the field of AI in the following sense, that the intuitive, fast decision-making layer, to me, has clear uh, correlation and correspondence to um, what we do at the moment with um, sub-symbolic techniques, in particular machine learning, and the rational control and uh, uh, decision layer, justification layer, is uh, more closely related to, to symbolic AI. And I've, I've mentioned it before, what we actually should go for is more research in direction of hybrid AI and uh, to question how we can actually get a fruitful interaction between those layers um, established in, in future AI systems, because I'm pretty, pretty convinced that, that this will give us better systems, uh, systems that can, to a certain extent, reflect upon their own decision making and eventually adjust and detect uh, mis misconception and, and adjust its behavior. So, um, and uh, for me personally, it was for the very beginning of my personal career, the idea of uh, the exploration of abstract theories and the capabilities of humans to conduct thought experiments that, that got me intrinsically motivated to enter that field. Well, I was particularly interested in the very beginning in the field of mathematics. So how can you discover, explore mathematical theories on the computer? Because that was for me an, an activity that, that I thought is, is um, very, very hard to achieve on, on, on computers. And um, I thought that this is therefore a very important challenge for computers um, to, to dive into in order to show uh, what the limits or no limits of AI actually are. Um, well, the researchers in the field of artificial intelligence are of, are, of course, aware of the challenge of mathematics and exploring new knowledge in mathematics and so on. And just recently, there was an excellent article published here in Nature uh, end of last year. In December, you see it here, 1st of December, um, which in the title says, Deep Minds AI helps untangle the mathematics of knots. And, and in there, what they actually did was they used machine learning to discover potential patterns and relations between mathematical objects. So here they established using machine learning technology, a connection between a theory um, on knots and uh, theories on permutations. And then were able to actually uh, correlate knowledge in one area with knowledge and structures in the other area. This is fascinating work. Uh, but, but clearly, it's still weak AI, right? So there, there are no representation, no explicit representation generated and assessed in the systems themselves. It's just about correlations between existing structures. And of course, you can make co conjectures on, on, uh, from, from one side to the other side. But it's not that you have here an architecture, as we discussed it before, where uh, representations themselves become objects in the, in the computer. And well... I personally share here uh, the opinion with Wolfgang Bibel. I recently exchanged an, an, uh, thoughts and an article with him. And um, he, he, in this article, or he gave a talk, I think, just last month at uh, Humboldt University about that. I have, have to talk to him again. So our communication was end of last year. And, and uh, I had a draft I could read by him. And I'm pretty much on the line of what he wrote in that draft. And he says, in AI, abstract representations are or should be, should, 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 should most strongly be objects of study. And um, he calls them representing objects, R or Bs, abbreviated in the, in the remainder of the talk. So R or Bs are, of course, key to symbolic AI. I mean, in logic and so on, we build representing objects and we encode them then on the computer. I come to that in a second. And um, that, is, that is fundamental, that we can now these, take these representing objects and put them in the computer. And in a sense, uh, they thereby become physical, accessible, manipulatable. We can experiment with them. Uh, and, and this was possible by the advent of computer technology and combination with AI technology, which makes these representing objects first-class 
uh, citizen, so to say, in, in com computer technology. So, and I think that uh, symbolic AI and logic in, com com uh, in, in combination with computer experimentation on such representing objects deserve increased attention as an experimental science. And eventually you could even argue that this way, representing objects become part of nature. Uh, in the very end, we can, can eventually uh, discuss that. That is, of course, uh, an, a position that Wolfgang Giebel sketched in there, and he points to mathematical objects and theories as uh, particular examples. And we had then a personal debate because I said, well, you can also take metaphysical objects and theories, even logics, as uh, examples here. And that is actually what I want to focus in the remainder of this talk on. Um, so we had a little debate here because he didn't see the metaphysics part so um, obvious, uh, and and this is where we distinguish uh, or where our both opinions so far um, um, are not aligned, uh, so to say. So this is what we actually did in own research in the past decade. Um, so I looked into nature language arguments typically in the area of metaphysics. We also looked in other areas, uh, but, but in this talk, I want to focus on, on those uh, in, in metaphysics. We turned them into representing objects. And by representing objects, I mean, we even turned the logic itself into a representing objects that could be manipulated. So the, the logics in our experiments are not hardwired in the computer. So I'm not assuming classical first order logic as uh, the logic I'm, I'm, I'm working with, and then I'm, 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 I'm stuck to it. No, logic itself becomes negotiable in the approach. And the representation of the argument in the logic then becomes negotiable in the in the uh, computer. And then we conduct an experiments about uh, those representing objects, which gives us, again, feedback on the nature language argument, so to say. And you see here, the human is still quite uh, involved a lot. So the, the nature language arguments typically come from humans. We looked at the ontological argument for the existence of God a lot, um, come to that. And um, also the representation of those um, nature language arguments in ROBs um, have been typically proposed by, by humans so far, but I changed that slightly. At the very end, I will um, show you uh, a little bit of a new picture here. Um, yeah, and, and here a little bit of history of, of this own work. In 2012, 13, um, and 13 it was when Spiegel International here reported, well, uh, computer scientists prove God exists and so on. So it were first uh, reports on, on our experiments on the ontological argument. And uh, we had then reports on that worldwide. The latest articles on the topic, um, you see the titles copied here. These are the ones I recommend if you want to dive into that. Uh, they also give you the references to, to the earlier articles, and I'll show you a few of them. But of course, what we didn't do, we didn't prove or disprove the, <laughs> the existence of God. Think about the previous slide, what we looked at, we looked at the arguments and we looked at the representing objects of these arguments and assessed them as representing objects on the computer and thereby got very useful feedback for the argument. Um, but it, it's an, it, it informed the argument itself. It, it, it didn't say we prove now God existence or disprove God existence. That is a slightly different story because it also involves many other aspects like, like what is existence, questions about that, um, which is a question which we didn't address in this experiment. Here. And this was about experiments about the representing objects on the computer and what they can tell us uh, and, 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 and in which way they can inform us about the um, about the argument, the nature language argument. Um, so we in particular looked at Kurt Gödel's variant of the ontological argument and uh, Kurt Gödel's um, variant of the ontological arguments itself comes in many different variants, namely slight emendations proposed by Damien Scott, by Anderson, by Fitting and so on. Uh, so we had a huge playground to, to play with um, or to study here. And uh, this is the descriptum that was found in, in Kurt Gödel's Nachlass you see here. Uh, that is the one we started with uh, investigating in the computer. And um, that, that goes back to 2012, actually, when I gave an, a talk at the uh, uh, Kurt Gödel Society in Vienna on universal logical reasoning. And in the end proposed that with that approach, 
I should be able now to actually do what I showed you uh, a couple of slides before, namely turn natural language arguments um, and their representations on pen and paper into the computer, represent them and encoding in the computer and then conduct experiments. That was what I proposed at the end of the talk. I joined forces with a person in the audience, Bruno Wolfson, Logel Paleo, and then uh, in, in collaboration, uh, we verified then as a first contribution here the, the ontological argument in Scott's variant of Gödel uh, on the computer. Um, and we also found problems in there. Um, namely, the original variant of Kurt Gödel had an inconsistency in there. Um, and we were able in a uh, paper uh, two, two, uh, two, three years later at Ichkai to explain what the problem is about that inconsistency. It took us a bit because I first had to understand my own theorem prover. What it told me about this inconsistency, it really took me quite some time to understand what the source of the inconsistency was because that was automatically explored by computer technology and wasn't seen by myself and it wasn't seen by other philosophers. Um, we then uh, published further papers where we dived more deeply into other variants as well. For instance, the variants proposed by Anthony Anderson and Melvin Fitting, which avoid the modal collapse. And these uh, results, these differ differentiating results on the modal collapse were then confirmed. So we, we can show that Dana Scott's variant has the modal collapse. Modal collapse means um, that what you can say in the in the concrete actual world necessarily holds also for other all other worlds or in other worlds i mean the the idea of a modal logic of a modal ontological argument collapses and this is meaningless in, in a way um, so these these results on the suffering of Gödel's original variant of a modal collapse and the way uh, Anthony Anderson and Melvin, Melvin Fitting are able to prevent the modal collapse were, were also confirmed then by, by computer technology automatically. And uh, then I went on with an ultra filter analysis of different variants uh, um, of the ontological arguments, in particular the ones by Anderson and Fittings. And um, in order to better understand what the, the nature of their way to avoid modal collapse is actually. And this then helped me to actually with the computer automatically explore new, much simpler variants of the ontological argument, which now again inform the argument itself, because in a way I think uh, the argument is brought back to the original one by Anselm, or it's simplified to a point that it might become debatable how much meaning there still is in, in the ontological argument. And you see here how this interaction between um, computer and human um, created new knowledge or new insights about this argument in the way I described. And it was possible by uh, what I call universal metalogical reasoning. Um, so this is an approach which um, I, I follow in my research since many years, um, which goes back to that quote here by Leibniz, a motivational part of it, you can say. Um, I read it briefly. If we had it, a characteristica universalis, we should be able to reason in metaphysics and morals in much the same way as in geometry and analysis. And um, well, you see it here, uh, reason in metaphysics and morals as we do it in mathematics, the connection also between these two fields. And um, the way I, I, I handle this challenge in the computer is that I take one logic as a base logic, as a, as a fix, as a fixed starting point, and this is a sufficiently rich and expressive logic, namely classical higher order logic, but I take it as a meta logic, as a formalism in which I then express the other logics as representing objects themselves. So the logics itself, the, the, the object logics I work with themselves become um, um, objects that can be manipulated and changed. And in these object logics, you then formulate variants of the um, the, the ontological arguments. Uh, so this is all explained in this article here. Um, and here's a picture that describes it a little bit the other way around. You also find that in the AI, um, the, the article that uh, appeared in the AI journal together with my colleagues from Luxembourg, um, Leon van der Torre and uh, uh, Xavier Parent, who is now in Vienna. 
And um, you see it depicted here again. So we call it the logic key methodology because logics are key <laughs> to this methodology. And the, the foundation is a sufficiently expressive meta logic in which you then uh, encode the logics you're interested in. For instance, intentional higher order modal logics. And in these object logics then, which you can vary, you formulate further knowledge like an, an, an theory that helps you in the, in the investigation or an entire world ontology. And here we, for instance, encoded a theory, a mathematical theory about ultra filters and use then this ultra filter theory for the study of Gödel's ontological argument uh, in, 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 in the form of a representing objects. So this is uh, roughly the, the logic key methodology applied to the area of uh, metaphysics. But in this article in, in AI Journal, we explain it, how it works for, um, in particular, for the area of building trustful AI systems. So for, for normative reasoning and for ethical legal theories, instead of investigating Gödel's ontological argument. Um, well, I skipped those slides here. Um, they um, particularly tell, talk about how we use now the machinery, so computer systems in the background, like the Isabel Hall system to connect these applications with lots of tools, state-of-the-art tools that have been built by the community. Uh, because lack of time, I think I, I skipped that and don't go into the details. But what I want to say is that this methodology, the logic -y methodology, very uniformly supports now by, by giving you direct access to these theorem proving systems that already exist for the meta logic, uh, the aggressive meta logic. Uh, so it, that in this way, it uniformly supports research, education, and application in different disciplines, in, in, in philosophy, logical foundations, in, in metaphysics, in, in computer science, logical foundations, in mathematics, uh, logical foundations, and then applications in, in these areas. Um, well, also here, I don't dive into the details. You just should get the rough picture. Gödel's ontological argument starts with some axioms and definitions, and then it sketches an argument um, that, that uh, goes over five, six steps here. And you can investigate further implications, like modal collapse, what holds that necessarily holds, how about self-difference, and so on. Uh, the, the ontological argument itself says necessarily there exists a godlike being or there exists a godlike being in the in the current world. And it, it, it infers that from these assumptions, from Gödel's axioms and from Gödel's definitions and, and shorthands. So as I said, the idea here is not to go into the details of the argument. Um, if you're interested in that, join a talk I give at the Logic and Religion webinar in May or I look at the forthcoming paper uh, on uh, where I explain the simplified variant of Gödel's ontological argument to appear in, in Sophia. Um, I, can, I can send you a preprint if, if uh, persons are interested. What you should now on an abstract level consider for this talk is the following. What we did is now we took these informal definitions, looked at the um, suggestions by Kurt Gödel's and others on how they should be encoded in modal logic um, and took these recipes as um, uh, um, yeah, for guiding this process of, of, of encoding these representing objects in the computer. So they became physical in that process. So they are now in the computer living there. We can manipulate them. We can experiment with this uh, representation. And that is what you see here. This is the, the original variant um, of Gödel in the, in the version by Scott. Uh, so slight emendations by, by Dana Scott. And, and what is important here is that you see the definitions, the axioms, and here the inference steps, so the different theorems. Here necessarily they exist Scott or they exist Scott, exactly the same structure as proposed by, by, by Kurt Gödel, uh, respectively uh, Dana Scott. And um, this is the graph structure of uh, the dependencies in the, in the different derivation steps. So theorem T3 here is the one necessarily there exists God, and you can see how it's stepwise derived from definitions and the, and the axioms. And by computer experimentation, this is the crucial point now for this presentation, I was able, uh, via these intermediate investigations in ultrafilter theory, uh, to simplify the argument. 
uh, computer did that actually automatically. It showed me, hey, there's a much simpler argument. And, and this is the argument that, that I think now needs to be um, communicated back to the community um, uh, to, to challenge them and to say, look, if you think that Gödel's ontological argument in the variant of Scott is an interesting object, how about this here? It seems to be just a simplification of it. Um, well, it has been investigated with the computer, but I can explain you exactly how it relates to the previous variants and so on. That's what I do in this, this Sophia article. Um, but you see how the computer now plays a fundamental role in this process of getting to this simpler variant by experimentation with representing objects, um, which were manipulated by the, by the machine. So this is the simplified variant. Um, again, we don't go into the details. Um, you, you might just join me at the talk. So it's... Is this the only example that, that I have? I mean, the ontological argument is just a small piece um, of argument, few steps, a few definitions, a few axioms, and so on. Um, is that all what you can mean by do in terms of um, experimentation on the computer in metaphysics? No. Um, there is a PhD student of mine, Daniel Kirschner, who is working in collaboration with uh, Edward Salter since 2015-16. Uh, I, I visited uh, Stanford and Salter in 2015-16. That is when this project was born. And then, then uh, Daniel Kirschner took over the, in the collaboration and, and uh, uh, worked with his PhD thesis on the topic. And they are in, in collaboration uh, developing, in a way, um, Salter's or, or verifying and, and further developing in a way Salter's um, ideas on Principi, uh, Principia Logico Metaphysica. You find that online. Um, it's an, um, I think, meanwhile, more than 1,000 pages um, uh, big uh, piece of work. Uh, Edward Salter is working on since the 80s, since this book um, appeared on um, abstract objects, and he was then further and further developing these ideas. And uh, it seems to getting more and more to the, the intended uh, end point, the, the, the point when he wants to finally publish it. But you see that meanwhile, Daniel is mentioned on the front page uh, for his critical contributions. And these critical contributions are not just by Daniel, they were actually contributed in combination or in interaction with exactly the machinery I presented you. And uh, in his PhD thesis, uh, which Daniel just handed in, and you find here the code online, um, you, you find these 24 lines of uh, contributed uh, computer code encoding of Principia Logico Metaphysica. Um, you will find also in different points uh, Daniel being mentioned uh, for his critical contributions. And as I said on the previous uh, slide here, uh, a particular contribution was the detection of a paradox in in um, Ed Salter's work, which he thought he was aware of the paradox and he thought he could prevent it by the way he introduced his logical foundations. Uh, but but uh, Daniel Kirschner, in combination with the computer, was nevertheless able to actually pinpoint that the paradox was still there. And he was able to work out then or suggest an, um, a, a way to fix it. And, and now, you know, the latest version of Principia Logico Metaphysica can be seen as at a much higher level of reliability in a way because all the new variants and changes are automatically or directly verified with, with computer technology uh, for such inconsistencies and, and paradoxes. So that brings me now more or less uh, to uh, the last few slides of this presentation. Um, what I would like to, to, to question here is can we replace in the future uh, more and more, the human in the picture. So uh, let's say the human just enters a natural language argument uh, in in an informal way uh, in, in uh, nature language, and and the, the computer then tries to convert nature language argument itself, eventually still in the beginning with the help of the human, into these representing objects, and then the computer takes over and experiments with these representing objects themselves. So try to find out by having access to a whole ontology of different logical foundations considered as object logics to find out in which logic and which way of representing an argument in such a logic, 
And by conducting experiments, a um, particular argument can be verified or has to be refuted, or you find paradoxes and inconsistencies in there. We debated that already with some of my PhD students, and we have some ideas on gradually increase the level of flexibility and autonomy in the systems in experimenting also with this logic setup. But of course, at the moment, um, um, clearly the human has a fundamental role here in the picture. And this uh, is the question, how far can we get with such an, a picture in the future? And I think that uh, it will be crucial to have such a methodology in place, like we suggested with, with Logiki, where the object logics themselves are considered as objects being represented in the computer and not fixed a priori. So there, there is a lot speaking for this kind of meta-logical approach to universal logical reasoning from this perspective, because otherwise you can't make the logic itself uh, negotiatable and um, um, uh, manipulatable in the in the computer. So that brings me back to the very beginning. Uh, the difference uh, is so when we talked about metaphysics and natural sciences uh, and experimental sciences, um, and the quote by Timothy Williamson. The difference is that the natural scientists base their answers on observation, experiment, measurement, and calculation, while the metaphysicians base theirs on armchair reflections. And I think that seems to be not so true anymore. Well, yeah, sure, maybe the majority of um, work in that area is still conducted in the traditional style. But I think in the future, we will see more and more of this interaction. And I've looked at many of the latest publications, for instance, by metaphysicians like uh, Peter Fritz uh, and Bacon, um, also papers, the books by Stalnacker, Williamson, and so on. And my conviction is that lots of that work can actually be brought on the computer and be experimented with in the sense of uh, rep representing objects. And I think that when we do that, when we more and more enter in such an um, endeavor, then the difference actually between metaphysics and experimental sciences, even natural sciences, seems to disappear. We make then representing objects as physically man phys physical objects in a way that we can work with and that we can manipulate uh, with computer technology. So I think that brings me to the concluding remarks that um, AI is more than um, an overhyped technology. So it's way more than just machine learning. It's a young scientific discipline that more strongly should focus on the exploration of and experimentation with representing objects. Um, and that the exploration and explicit processing of such objects is, an, is a central and conceptual challenge, architectural challenge for the modeling and explaining of truly intelligent processes in computers. And that the declarative representations are particularly relevant for the realization of trusted, responsible AI systems. And in, in, in general, in direction of strong AI, since, since they make knowledge, normative and other knowledge, not only transparent and explainable, but also efficiently and robustly communicatable between humans and machines. So we can really engage, if we could get that picture flying, into an, a meaningful exchange of information between machine and human instead of just simulated intelligence on computer. And um, our intact interactive experiments in computational metaphysics are clearly motivated by such an ex ex uh, perspective. And progress in this direction, I think, also means progress in direction of strong AI systems. And uh, the last sentence I want to put here is that AI as a discipline and in combination with the availabilities of computers, of course, uh, is shifting the boundaries between humanities and experimental science, even natural sciences. Thank you.